want you to imagine that your first day of high school gym class. You and your classmates are huddled around as two of the school's most celebrated athletes begin selecting teams for an impromptu game of football. The gym teacher sits slouched in the old swivel chair, perusing a magazine as each and every student is ranked by their athletic ability. You wait self-consciously as the school's quarterback and running back begin fighting to have the best players to have on their team. You figure that as long as you're not the last one picked, everything will be a-okay. The process usually goes something like this. Jock for John's team, jock for Nick's team. Track star for John's team, track star for Nick's team. The process continues until all the all-star players have been selected and the remaining out-of-shape misfits wait anxiously as the last few players are picked by the team captains. However unfair, this selection process based on physical fitness has been the norm since football itself. The gym teacher blows the whistle and the game begins. The athletes enthusiastically engage in the game while the misfits abscond toward the sideline. Now, you see, in high school, the social hierarchy is not built on a holistic approach, but rather what I call an incomplete assessment. If you're attractive and you can play a sport well, you'll usually rank near the top, while the nerds and the geeks rank toward the bottom. Now, I think we can all relate to this in some capacity whether we were the hero on the football team, or perhaps the unsung hero, who may have single-handedly raised the average SAT score. We all had our place in the pecking order. Now, both the football player and the super nerd make valuable contributions to the high school, right? But usually only one is recognized as a result of the value system inherent in youth culture. The football player gets the bulk of the attention, while the super nerd may get a lousy certificate. Isn't it a great thing that adults have learned to abandon this system? Well, I'm convinced that similar systems are still in place in professional settings, too. One such example is the small business versus big business dilemma. Although consumer confidence levels in small business are at an all-time high, according to a recent Gallup survey, big business still does pose a significant threat to Main Street American small business. Take Amazon, for example, which just built a fulfillment city in La or a station in Livonia. They can offer practically any product or service imaginable to consumers at the most competitive prices and in the easiest shopping experience possible. Did you know that Amazon will spend nearly $10 billion annually on marketing campaigns, which is more than Target, Walmart, Best Buy, Kroger, and Home Depot combined? Now, going back to my earlier analogy, Amazon plays the role of the coveted football player by distracting consumers away from local retailers with its attractively low prices. even to the point where some large department stores have been forced out of business. Now, small businesses may not be able to offer the lowest prices or the most convenient shopping experience, but there's one thing I think that small businesses do better than any large business, and that's the creation of localized value. These are the men and women who make our coffee in the morning, who fix our cars when they're broken, and who prepare our tax returns in April. Now, at this point, some of you may be wondering why a teenage boy is talking so much about business. It's a fair question, so here's my story in less than 30 seconds. When I was 14 years old, I was contracted by a major US consulting company to assist in the transformation of a paper data tracking binder into a digital system. Now, in order to contract as a minor, I had to reserve a Michigan limited liability company. I did so, but then the deal took forever to process and actually never came to fruition, but I learned to design websites in free time. I began designing websites for local business owners to establish positive cash flow and decided to keep with it because I liked it. I went from a simple one-man uh, web design operation into a full-service digital marketing consulting company 
complete with executive team. I'm extremely passionate about free enterprise and have even partnered with the United States Chamber of Commerce as an advocate on small business. I'm an ardent Rotarian and member of the Livonia and Dearborn Area Chamber of Commerce. Now, I don't say these things to prop myself up, but rather to build context for my argument. Through the Chamber and Rotary, I've gotten to know several successful small business owners that contribute to the strength of our communities on a daily basis. And this is important because when I was first starting my business, I went on a search for what makes a business great. I'm pleased to say that I think I've discovered an answer. Here are the results. For a business to be great, it must, be, uh, it must create great value. Obvious, right? Then perhaps a better question is, what is value and how do we create it? Well, the answer to this question is mostly subjective and will depend on personal opinion. In my eyes, value is best created when businesses can quickly and accurately respond to the taste and desires of its customers, all the while making long-lasting contributions to the local community. For example, corporations create value for consumers by offering the lowest prices possible and the most convenient shopping experience. In contrast, small businesses offer better customer service and a proverbial commitment to the community. Remember, corporations are designed to generate the maximum return on investment for shareholders. That's why they don't necessarily care about the city you live in as long as they make money. Alternatively, small businesses are very committed to the communities because communities empower them. Small businesses act as a linkage institution between citizens, tourists, entrepreneurs, and city officials. They help shape and strengthen community bonds like no big box store could ever accomplish. As I continued my study of small business, I realized that they'll affect communities in two primary avenues. And that's something called community definition and community engagement. When you think of Ann Arbor, what comes to mind? The University of Michigan, football, parks, restaurants, pubs, and eateries. When you go to Ann Arbor, you can go to Zingerman's for a sandwich, or you can go to Pinball Pete's for an arcade game. You can go to Blimpy Burger for lunch, or you can go to the Gandy Dancer for a fancy dinner. Each and every one of these establishments is incredibly successful because they define what Ann Arbor is about. Think about it this way. When an artist is painting a beautiful picture, she'll have a palette with a whole bunch of different colors on it, right? And then she'll paint her beautiful picture by blending all these colors together. Well, there may be more of one color than the other, but all of them have their own unique purpose. Similarly, small businesses act as these colors in a picture that collectively defines a town, such as Ann Arbor or Livonia. On the flip side, a big box store like Walmart is probably not going to contribute to the identity of a town. It's just too mainstream. It's like painting a picture with one bland shade of gray. At the end of the day, people want to visit businesses that stand out from the crowd. They want to participate in a one-of-a-kind experience. And unfortunately, Walmart just won't cut it. Now, when I travel out of state, people sometimes will ask about our hometown. And so we'll usually tell them, oh, well, we live about 20 minutes away from Ann Arbor, because nobody knows where South Lyon is, right? So usually we'll get greeted with the, uh, you know, go blue or something like that. But if not, we've also heard things like, well, oh, isn't that where Zingerman's is? You'd be surprised that a simple delicatessen rivals a Big Ten university for name recognition. Now, it's no secret that Small Biz has been the champion of better, better customer service for years. I believe that an exceptional product coupled with friendly customer service creates a business with character and charisma. And in a way, that's why smaller is better when it comes to defining what a town is about. However, a well-defined competitive community identity is a foundation for building a phenomenal city. But it's only worthwhile for a company to contribute to an identity 
if it then actively works to maintain it. And that's where community engagement comes into play. Community engagement is when local small businesses contribute time, money, people, and resources to help strengthen the community around them. Now, through my time in Rotary, I've gotten to know several successful business owners who, in their free time, will help out in the community or across the globe. For example, our current club president, Bill, has owned and operated his own industrial cleaning company for more than 20 years. In his free time, he travels across the Midwest sharing about humanitarian efforts and distributing our Rotary Club's four-way test soccer ball, which has the Rotary Creed written in 16 different languages on it. Now, this project began as a simple soccer ball that started within our club, and it's expanded across the state of Michigan, across the Midwest, and even, even globally to countries like Cameroon and Africa. When I talk business with Bill, I can see how his involvement in Rotary shapes his business practices. It can oftentimes be hard to find an honest contractor, but Bill is definitely a man of character and integrity. I have to say that his involvement in the community is both a result of and the impetus for his exemplary character. Now, sometimes you'll hear of a large company like Target or Walmart donating a couple hundred dollars to a charity event, but the occasions are few and far between. And frankly, for a billion dollar company like that, a $100 donation doesn't take a whole lot of dedication. I think that a small team of volunteers that regularly visits a Gleaner's Food Bank or the Capuchin Soup Kitchen or similar makes a more substantial impact. Now, my goal isn't to sound anti-capitalistic. Large corporations are incredibly important to the American economy. They're sort of like the solid stone columns that support the Parthenon. But when it comes to analyzing business impact on small scale, small business like mom and pop shops will blow corporations out of the water any day. First off, large corporations are just too big to maintain loyalty to one small town or city. As a result, they're usually forced to generalize their identities to accommodate a broader region. Take Starbucks, for example. If they named all their beverages after points of interest in Livonia, they would appeal to like a nano-sized segment of its market. As a result, it's forced to generalize with beverage names like Ice Caramel Macchiato and Cocoa Cluster Frappuccino Blended. On the flip side, restaurants like Detroit Burger on 8 Mile have hamburgers called the Woodward Ave and the I-94, which is a two pound cheeseburger that stacks almost a foot tall. And if you actually finish it, they'll put your picture on the wall and you get a free t-shirt. <laughs> now that's something you will not find at a McDonald's. And thinking back to the idea of community definition, the I-94 hamburger is a perfect example of how a small business or restaurant differentiates itself with a unique product, which then allows it to contribute to the identity of a city. Now, corporations will also fall short when it comes to quickly responding to consumer demands. Now remember, a couple minutes ago I said that my definition of value is when corporations or any business can quickly respond to demands. Because in large corporations, the influential decision maker is usually detached from the customer experience. As a result, they see sales projections and um, spreadsheets in a rear view mirror fashion. That's why it can take behemoths almost a quarter or even two to recognize a trend. Then add another six months for product development and another three months for testing, and the trend may have vanished almost entirely. In contrast, small businesses are agile. They respond quickly to what their customers want, usually because the owner and operator is working the frontline jobs. They lack complicated corporate hierarchy charts so they can change directions rapidly without much fanfare. Trying to turn a large corporation sideways is like trying to steer the Titanic away from the iceberg in time. There's too much mass which makes altering the direction of the momentum an insuperable feat. Did you know 
that small companies will donate 250% more to charities than large business. And according to the Civic Economic Study of Grand Rapids, Michigan, for every $100 you spend in a local store, $68 stays in the local economy. But for every $100 you spend in a big box store like Target or Kroger when you go grocery shopping, less than $45 stays in the local economy. By making the conscious decision to shop local, you're supporting your own town, you're putting food on the table for the people who work locally, you're helping the homeless, and you're promoting the American dream. And that's something no other country on the planet can do better than America. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Grant Sobchak, and that was my commercial for small business. Thank you very much.